Good morning. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. How good is it that we truly do have a God that we can worship wherever we go? We don't have to go to the temple in Jerusalem. We don't have to face Mecca. We, can't, we don't even have to be here in church. We can sing to him and praise him everywhere because he is eternal and he is always with us. Let's continue in worship this morning with him 641. This week, I had a really cool verse pointed out to me, Exodus 14, 14, and it says, the Lord will fight for us. We don't need to do anything. So no matter how hard our struggles are, no matter how um, up in the air everything may feel, we just need to trust and obey, and he will take care of the rest. Let's continue. No. 
Well, it's a beautiful rain, si- rain, rain shiny. Yeah, that sounds right. Rain shiny Sunday morning. So glad you guys are here. Glad you guys are able to be with us today. It is potluck Sunday today. So by the time I get done preaching, and definitely by the time Sunday school is over, we should be smelling the food. So we hope you guys will stick around with us. We at Grace Church, we're here to bring people closer to Jesus. And our food is so high in cholesterol, it will bring you closer to Jesus. So come and enjoy it with us. So we hope you'll stick around for the potluck today after church. It'll be a good time. Last week, there was a dear couple here at Grace Church that brought me a little something. Now, don't get nervous. This is bacon on my socks. And so in honor of that, because I'm a bacon fanatic, in honor of that, we brought a bacon-wrapped pork loin that I cooked on a rotisserie last night. And my wife would not let me and Doug Swanson cut into it. I wanted to. It was nine. We were sitting around the campfire, and like, Doug, we got it. And Rachel's like, it's for tomorrow. Don't touch it. Oh, man. It was killing me. So save some for me. That's all I'm asking. Please save some for me. But do stick around. We hope you guys will stay for potluck today. It's going to be a great time. So do join us after Sunday school for that. Church camp out. We have a camp out we're doing up, at the, up in Brewster, at a ranch up in Brewster. They've got a little lodge set up for us with a cafeteria and a kitchen, and it's going to be a lot of fun. There's a place to put up tents and a few camper hookups and all those things. If you want to join us, we kind of need to know today, all right? And if you think, well, I'm not going to know until Wednesday, but I'm thinking about it, let me again know that today, because then we can at least get your name kind of on the list. So if you're not for certain, but you're thinking that you're probably going to go, I need to know that today, because we're going to be talking to our cooks this week, getting the menu set, getting groceries bought. So we just need to know, all right? Cost is 25 bucks a family per day, so it's kind of, it's fairly inexpensive. There's a lot that you can do. It's going to be fun. That's a church camp out, but we need to know today. Awana registration happened this last Wednesday. We had a good number of kids show up, and more than last year, and we know we get registrations throughout the year, and on the first night especially, we had a good number of kids come this last week to get signed up. But Awana volunteers, if you're planning on working in Awana in any capacity, we'd like you to come tomorrow night for a meeting. It'll be be fun. We're going to have a good time just kind of talking through it tomorrow night at 630 here at the church. If you didn't register, but you'd like to get your kid registered, you can see Rachel, we, we was, she disappeared on me. I don't know where she went. Or uh, Miss Laura, right? You'll help out with that. So go see Miss Laura. Registration forms, and you can help her. All right. Homeward Trail is hosting a men's retreat on Saturday, September 14, and a women's retreat on Saturday, September 21. If you're interested in any one of those, we have some information, or you can go to homewardtrail.org. That's a camp that we participate in. Homewardtrail.org, men and women, and you guys can look those up for September 14 and September 21. And Pastor Eric is going to come on up here. Pastor Eric, I still call him Pastor Eric. Dude, you're still a pastor, right? He's going to come on up here, and he's got something about financial peace. Good morning, everybody. I'm sure all of you have some financial struggles that have been going on, right, with all of the facts of inflation and the cost of everything. I'm like... Every time we go to the grocery store, I kind of think sometimes we might need to take out a loan to be able to make it home with milk. But um, if any guys are struggling, Financial Peace University is um, a program that's put on by Ramsey Flush University, our organization, to teach biblical principles on how to handle your money, budget your money, get out of debt, pay off all of your bills, which is great. Let me tell you, God blessed us that in December of last year, we became debt-free paid off our house, our cars, everything, and let me tell you, not making a mortgage payment every month is amazing. So if you're interested in learning God's principles, we're actually doing it during Awana, so if your parents have kids, no daycare needed, no babysitters needed, come to it, 645 to 815, starting September 4th, come with us, learn some ways of handling your money better, and hopefully get out of debt and enjoy what it's like to live life without owing somebody something, so thanks. Thank you, Eric. That is happening down in the Parsonage, which is like three houses down. We're on the we're on the end, the northeast corner of the intersection of, of Grant and Baxter's. So that's where we are down there. So 
you want to be a part of that, you're welcome to do so. It's actually in the building behind the parsonage. We call it the Bears Den, so you're welcome to be, to be part of that if you'd like to. So talk to Pastor Eric about that or any of the elders. That's Thomas right here in the shirt. He'll tell you, FPU, we're, we're there. So we we'll sign up for it. It's a good thing. Okay, today is kind of a, a tough Sunday for us to a degree, right? It's, there's a times in your life when you have people who they kind of grow up and they, they, do, they begin doing adult things. We have a, a special teenager here in our church who is, she's still a teen, but she's basically an adult. Natalie is her last Sunday here, and I'm going to make her cry, and I'm okay with that. Just don't make me cry, all right? Natalie has volunteered here at Grace Church. She's volunteered in our nursery. She's volunteered in our Awana. She's volunteered in our five-day clubs. She's up here at church cleanings. She's a Sunday school teacher. She just stepped down from teaching Sunday school. She has done a ton for Grace Church. She's on the worship team. Is there anything else I'm missing? I don't know. She probably vacuums on Tuesdays. I don't know. She's... And Good News Club, that, right, Good News Club at Palmer Elementary on Mondays. A ton of stuff Natalie has done, and she is leaving us for college. So you're not going to be here anymore, and that's kind of sad for us. I know really sad for your parents, but Natalie, we just want to acknowledge that. We want to pray for you, okay? But as a church, we're proud of you. You have grown into a wonderful, godly young woman, and we're proud of you, okay? As your pastor, I'm proud of you. Just letting you know that, okay? And I know we've said that before. But Natalie is just one of those teens you're just so proud of when they head off to school and college and you think, man, God's going to use them in a real way. And they're going to leave a hole here at Grace Church. And Natalie's going to leave a hole. Um, so we, we appreciate Natalie. We just wanted to recognize you for just a second. So thank you for your service to Grace and to God. We appreciate what you've done. So. Now, when Eden started school, she got engaged fairly quickly into her school year. Don't do that, thank you. Okay. Um, take your time, you know, be careful. Boys are evil, all right? This is just all you need to know, okay? All right. So we're going to pray for her today, but a couple things I want you to be aware of. This last week, we had a prayer request go out for a, friend, a family friend of ours. Tabitha Kirshner is her name. She went in the hospital with, uh, with some breathing problems. They found out that her lungs were full of all sorts of stuff. They actually expected her to pass away pretty much at any point all of this last week. I got a text message today from, from Tabitha's dad, who incidentally was the man who officiated Rachel and I's wedding. That's kind of that close family connection there. And Tabitha's going home on Tuesday. God has chosen to heal her, and she's going home on Tuesday. It was just incredible. The COPD is still there. She's still going to have long-term effects from that, and it's eventually probably going to take her life. But nonetheless, she's, she's healed to the point she can go home on Tuesday, and so we're so thankful to God for that. Frankly, almost miraculous healing is what it was, and we're very grateful to, that for, to God for that. So that's a huge thing. And then this last week, I had a phone call from a nursing home in Grand Island. A family member asked for the pastor from the Baptist Church in St. Paul to come and visit her, her mother, right? And she's 101 years old. So I get up there, and I visit the mom, and the mom was, she was basically sleeping the whole time. The nurse says, just talk to her, right? And so you guys know me. I could talk to a fence post. So I, I talked to her for quite a while. I just sat there in the bed beside her on the floor and just talked and sang a hymn with, them, with her. And then I was talking to Beulah there, and again, she's, she's unresponsive. And I just made a comment, Beulah, I'm going to have to leave now, but I need to get your phone number for your family. Before I go, I'll try to find a nurse, and maybe I'll come back and see you. And across the curtain, on the other side of the curtain, I heard a voice said, well, I have their phone number. I'm like, oh, you've been eavesdropping the whole time, and, and uh, her name was Megan, and Megan said, yeah, she said, in fact, I needed this today, so Megan gives me the no number for Beulah's daughter, I call Beulah's daughter, and in the part of the conversation, I said, out of curiosity, how did you ask for the Baptist preacher in St. Paul? I don't even know you guys, she said, well, he didn't ask for you, the nursing home asked for you, and so, okay, the nursing home said, you asked, you said the nursing home asked, I was there because God wanted me there, and it was just one of those things, wow, God, that's really cool how you coordinate those things. That's really cool, and I um, was able to pray with Megan, who is a believer, incidentally. Um, we got to talk to her about that. She is a believer, just struggling in life a little bit. So we're going to pray for Megan and Beulah both today, and just for that continued situation. We'll see what God does with that, but that was kind of a, just a fun little God moment, for sure, in that one. A couple things specifically in the bulletin. You're going to see our missionary of the month, Jim and Lisa Black, uh, Nigeria, where he's getting ready to go to. There's some, some just, he already left. Okay, he already left. There's a big financial crisis over there, um, and so there's some major concerns just politically and a lot of stuff happening there, and so you can pray for them. And then pray for our sister church in Ord, Bethel Baptist. They are beginning the transition to elders just as we did a couple of years ago. There are several churches that have already done that when we did, and there are more churches that are looking at doing that, and they're transitioning, praying for that. 
He's got four new believers he's discipling, and then they're considering a new outreach to kids this year as well. And so they want prayers for that. And then this week, I was aware of a couple conversations that happened. We had people from Grace who are trying to be neighbors, right? Because God says, love the Lord your God, the heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so they intentionally had conversations with neighbors just to get to be a neighbor. And that's a huge thing worth praising God for. Just the fact that we have people at church who are trying to be a neighbor. That, that's huge in today's world. And so if you guys have a story like that where, hey, I was able to reach out to somebody that I don't really know, just trying to get to know them a little bit better, let us know that. That's part of following God's commands is to be just a neighbor. And so that was worth, worth praising him for. And I got a text message on Wednesday about somebody who shared the gospel with a coworker. That was awesome. These are things that God's called us to do. And I appreciate you guys being willing to serve God in these capacities. So thank you so much for that. All right, let's go ahead and go to the Lord of Prayer. And then we're going to take the offering. Now, as a aside here, the offering, of course, is an act of worship. We know that. But there's no obligation. It's something that you do between you and your Lord. It's something that you do as an act of worship to Him. So you give however God leads you in that direction. Father, we praise you for today. The, the rain was beautiful today. It's a little dry outside, and we just love the fact that you sent this liquid sunshine. God, thank you. For the, for the church family who is here today. Lord, there are a lot of different things going on behind the scenes, things that people went through these last week or two, and some moments where you showed up in a huge way. God, we praise you for being the God who's in control, a God that we can trust even in really hard times, even in sometimes dangerous situations. We can still trust you, Lord. We praise you just how you coordinate things. We think of this conversation with Beulah and Megan this week and, and not even knowing how I got there except you wanted me there. And so, God, I just thank you for that conversation. I pray for Megan and Beulah both who were struggling in different ways this week. And Lord, I just pray that you'd be with them and bring comfort to them, that you would help them. Lord, we think of, we think of Natalie. We're going to miss her a lot around here. She has done so much. And God, I pray you bless her as she studies. I pray you help her to continue to be a light on this campus she's going to be at, pointing people to, to you, pointing people to relationship with your son. God, we just pray that you'd be with her. We're so proud. Lord, it's just amazing how you have matured this young woman um, into who she is today. And we pray for the rest of our teens that they would allow you to work through them as well, Lord, and that we can send them out knowing that, God, we, we've got some teens we're proud of. Lord, it's just great to have people like that in our church, to have adults like that in our church. Father, we think of, we think of our missionary, Jim, who's getting ready to head over where he's on his way right now. He's left. He's going to Nigeria. God, we pray that you'd be with him there. Give him safety. Give him protection. Help him as he ministers there. And we praise you for how you worked in Tabitha's life this week and her family's life. God, we thank you for that. God, today we come to praise you. We come to worship you. We pray we do this well for your glory. And part of doing that is through the giving of these gifts. I pray you would receive them well, use them for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. For the schools? Okay. Okay, school started. Let's pray for school real quick, all right? We do have it in there. I missed it. So I apologize. Let's pray for our schools. God, school started this week. In our area, the school started, and then some homeschool parents are starting if they haven't already started. Lord, teaching is, it's a full-time job plus some. The hours these teachers put in is incredible during the school year, and Lord, they're going to need strength. Help them as they deal with, with grace with the kids. Some of these kids, they come from broken homes. They have tough situations. Lord, I pray that the teachers would love well. I pray that they would teach well. I pray for the students that they would learn well. God, may, may you be evident in our schools this year. We pray for our, the, even the, the Good News Bible Club is going to be starting up in Palmer here in a little bit, and it's going on there at the Palmer Elementary School. And Lord, I pray that that Bible Club would go well. There'd be kids who would come, lives changed. But God, help our schools, our teachers, our students, not just here in, in St. Paul, but really around our nation and around the world. We know this next generation, Lord, eventually they'll come to be our leaders and God, we look at the world and we see different morals being taught or not taught at all. God, we need you. Help us to remember that all the time, God. We pray you would work. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.
Thank you, Arlene. Good job. All right. All right. We're in the book of John today. The book of John. So Grace Church, we exist to make maturing followers of Jesus Christ, and we're Christ-centered, Bible-based, which means our sermons come right from here. That's what that means. This is where we get our material from. So we don't have this book that's given to us every year, say these are the sermons we're going to preach. No, it's one of these things we... The elders and I, we talk about it, and I pray about it, and, and things, okay, God, what do you want us to do? And so we're in the book of John. We're going to walk through it, kind of a verse at a time, and kind of see where God takes us here, but we're in John chapter 7 today. John chapter 7. There's a few Bibles, if you want to look it up in the few Bibles. Uh, the verses will also be on the screen as well. But in John chapter 7 today, we have a, a short little passage here that basically describes Jesus going undercover, undercover boss, if you will. Now, I don't really watch that TV show, but I've seen some clips from it, enough to know there's some pretty funny scenes in there, like when the employee tries to fire the boss, okay? Because the CEO, he goes undercover to see what the employees think of the company, to see how well the training is going, to see if everybody's really doing their job, and so he goes under, he goes undercover as an underling, and then the ones I love the most when he gets fired, right? And like, dude, you can't fire me, I'm the boss, right? Those are, I just love those, okay? Jesus, in this little segment, goes undercover. And there's an interesting lessons in here for us. There's some things for us to pull as, as followers of Jesus Christ. There's some things for us to think about. Some real things for us to process through. But in the middle of the book of John, here it's John chapter 7, we find that this short passage, just 13 verses, describing a time when Jesus goes undercover. And in this narrative, John includes an undercover view of what the crowd really thinks about Jesus. Of course, that challenges us to think about and examine ourselves and think, what do I think about him? What do I think about Jesus? There's a challenge here for us. And then even in the middle of this, there's this fun little section we're going to deal with that kind of will, will blow your mind for just a second here as we process through what John records in John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse 1. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now, you guys who know me, y'all know that when I get excited, I talk fast. When I get, yeah, that's basically it. When, I'm, when I get, get passionate about something, I end up talking fast. And this morning, there's something in here I'm going to get keyed up about, and I'm already feeling it. So I'm going to pray that I slow down, okay, for just a moment. And I'll watch my wife, and you'll give me the sign, okay? She'll give me the sign. I won't watch you. <laughs> You don't say amen to that part. No. It's hurtful. All right, let's pray. God, today I need to speak slowly and clearly. But today, you have a lot to share with us. Today, there is, I mean, your word is given. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And God, today, this passage is also profitable to us. And I pray that we would glean something from it, that we'd learn something from it, something that would apply to us. And, and Lord, use your Holy Spirit. And if necessary, even change the words coming out, of, coming out of my mouth so that they actually make sense. Lord, I just pray that you would just use this message for your glory today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. Now, what is the this he's referring to? Well, in John chapter 6, we see where many of his disciples turn back and no longer walked with him. His teaching offended them. They didn't understand it, they got offended, and they turned back and no longer walked with him. And he turns to the twelve and says, what about you? Do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, whom shall we go? You had the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know, and you are the Holy One of God. After this conversation then, John 7, after this, Jesus went about in Galilee. If you understand Israel, Israel faces, the, the west is on the Mediterranean Sea, and then the northern part of Israel is Galilee, and the southern part is Judea section down there, the Judea region, and, and he was not allowed to go down in the southern part. He didn't feel like he could because the Jews were seeking to kill him. The reality of his life at this moment is that the Jews wanted him dead. If you look at seven, chapter 7, verse 13, we can assume it's an assumption, I understand that. We can assume that the Jews here referred to most likely the Jewish leaders. The religious leaders wanted Jesus dead at this time. And so he was wandering about in Galilee, not, not without purpose, but he remained there in Galilee. Which meant he could not go into Jerusalem. 
He could not say to go to Judea where Jerusalem was, which created a dilemma. And verse 2 tells us what the dilemma was. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. The feast of booths was at hand. So Jesus was up in the northern part of Israel, could not go into Jerusalem because the Jews were seeking to kill him, and the feast of booths was at hand. Now why is that important? Well, if you don't understand what the feast of booths, what it is, you're going to have a hard time understanding why this was important. So let's do a little sidebar here for just a second. What is the feast of the booths? Let's do the background here. In Leviticus chapter 23, we read about the feast of the booths. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month, and for seven days, is the feast of booths to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. As a clarifier, for some, this is called the Feast of Tabernacles. You might hear it referred to as the Feast of Tabernacles. ESV has it translated as the Feast of Booths. Jumping on down. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, so that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. This is the description of the Feast of Booths that the Jews were to celebrate. Okay? So what do we know? Well, we know the Feast of Booths, Tabernacles. It commemorated the time when Israel lived in temporary shelters in the wilderness. They had just left Egypt. They didn't have houses in which to live. So they came out, and in the wilderness, they built these temporary shelters. They looked different, I'm sure. Some were canvas. Some may have been blankets. We don't know all the building supplies they had with them, but they were temporary booths. Tents is really what most of us assume that they were, these temporary shelters. This festival began at the solemn assembly on the first day <clears throat> and ended with another solemn assembly on the eighth day. In between was this huge celebration. As there was this, again, this reminder of God bringing them out of slavery and delivering them from that and them escaping Egypt. It was a big celebration, right? The 4th of July for us is a huge celebration. That's basically what it is for the Israelites, all right? You have eight days of nonstop partying. How would you like 4th of July to be like that for us? I could go for that. I could shoot fireworks eight days straight. I'm okay with that, right? Can't afford it, but I could do that, right? This is what the Jews were doing. They're getting around, they get excited, dancing, waving palm branches, a lot of things they were supposed to do as part of this. The people were to live in the booths, they were for the seven days, okay? It's a very real reminder, living in these temporary shelters, seven days, making daily offerings by fire, rejoice before the Lord, waving bundles of palm fronds, leafy branches, poplars, and fruit. This is a lot they were supposed to do. We have here a picture, still celebrated today by Orthodox Jews. So you'll see the buildings kind of down there in the street, the temporary, the brown temporary shelters. They build those in front of their current homes, and they live in them. This is what they do. It's still happening today. Orthodox Jews are still doing this, this Feast of the Booths. Feast of Booths. Now, this was a big deal because for Jesus, the dilemma here was that it's one of the three feasts held in Jerusalem that all Jewish males were required by religious law to attend. Jesus, being a Jewish male, the Feast of Booths at hand, he was required to attend this, but he couldn't go to Jerusalem, into Judea. He couldn't go down there. Why? Because the Jewish leaders wanted him dead. Do we see the dilemma here a little bit? This is his problem. This is his problem. So, John chapter 7, 3 through 4, his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Now, some of you know that I have a scotch of sarcasm within me. Not very much, but a little bit, okay? It's a spiritual gift here at Grace Church. We believe that. And in this verse, I read, maybe not necessarily sarcasm, but a little bit of snarkiness from his brothers. And I get this because when you read the next verse, you're going to understand why. But his brothers are saying to him, look, just go on down to Judea. Your disciples, they, they need to see the works that you're doing. And if you want people to know who you are, you got you to be out in the front. you got to be up front in everybody. You can't keep things a secret if you want people to know things, right? It's impossible for people to know you and stay secret. That doesn't work that way, right? So what if you do these things, show yourself to the world. There's a little almost snarkiness on his brother's part, okay? His brothers wanted the public to prove himself. They wanted this. That's what they said. Hey, go down and just prove yourself to who you are, all right? For not even his brothers believed in him. Now do you sense the snarkiness? 
Not even his brothers believed in him. Can you imagine growing up in a house with a brother who claimed to be God's son? In your humanity, how would you perceive that brother? Dude, I, I'm just, I, I, I don't even know how I'd respond necessarily. When you don't believe it, when he's saying these things, and it doesn't make sense to you, even though he's doing some miraculous signs, and everybody's kind of gathering around him, and he's all that and more, right? As a brother, you tend to be like, dude, just go away a little bit. His brother's like, you know, just go on down. If you, if you think you're all that and more, just, just prove it to people. People need to see this. They need to see this. Just, just get out of here a little bit. His brothers didn't even believe in him. I mean, as I, as I read into this, I just, it's just amazing to me the, the dilemma that he had. I can't go down there because of Jews, the Jewish leaders seeking to kill me. My own brothers are encouraging me. Why? Because they don't even believe who I am. I am who I say I am. They don't understand. They don't get it, right? And from Jesus' perspective, how hard would that be? If you're a family, not to get it. Not to get the truth. And they didn't. Verses 6 through 7. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. She said, look guys, my time hasn't yet come. You don't understand what's going on here. My time hasn't come, but your time is here. In fact, your time is always here. The world can't hate you, it hates me. But your time is now. You know, it's, it's interesting. John is the one who recorded the book of Revelation. And at the end of the book of Revelation, he, he writes this verse in, in chapter 22, come, Lord Jesus, come. Right? Write it in there. So we sit and we think about that. What would that be like for Jesus to come? We know that as of right now, his time isn't yet. It may be 30 minutes from now. It may be 30 days, maybe 30 years, maybe 300 years. We don't know. We know that his time isn't now. But as an aside, I think Jesus might, if he were with us today in person, he might be saying the same things to us. But your time is here. Your time is now. The world can't really hate you. It hates me because I tell it these are evil. But your time is now. You don't understand. My time isn't here yet. Your time is now. Grace Church, again, we exist to make maturing followers of Jesus Christ. And if Jesus was on this platform today saying those words to you, what would that mean to you? What do you think Jesus would want you to do differently this week if he said to you, to your face, your time is now? That's something for us to think about. What would that mean for us? My time is now. I bet we could probably, without too much of a problem, come up with something that Jesus would want from us this week. Your time is now. Jesus, in the middle of this, he just wanted his brothers to understand. He wanted them to understand. My time isn't now. Your time is always here. Again, the world can't hate you. It hates me. It can't hate you. But your time is now. He wanted them to understand. Verses 7, chapter 7, verses 8 through 9. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. And after saying this, he remained in Galilee. My time has not come yet. My time isn't here. It's not my time to do this. But your time is now. You go up. I'm going to stay back, you guys go up. And he remained in Galilee. So what we know, again in summary, like, but dude, pastor, can't you think any deeper than this? Maybe not. He sent them and he stayed behind. That's a great conclusion. Could you do that one by yourselves? Yes, you probably could. All right, snarkiness, again, it's my gift. Here we go. Jesus wanted to understand. We know that he sent them, and we know he stayed behind. Now, there is a lot in this passage, these 13 verses, where we don't necessarily know the motives Again, my opinion, and I'm being very clear, my opinion, when his brother said, leave here and go to Judea, your disciples may also may see the works you're doing, I read into that snarkiness. Others may not. They may read full sincerity. I don't know. We don't know the motives. And the reason I read the snarkiness is because John says, for even his brothers didn't believe in him. Right? So I get from that a little bit of snarky tone. Some would disagree. That's fine. But there's other things in this passage where we don't necessarily get to see the motives. And this next part is part of that. For Jesus goes undercover. We don't see the motives for this. 
In fact, we almost see a contradiction and maybe even a theological problem as we dive into this. After his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. So I read through this, and I wrote my sermon, and then on Wednesday I got up here and I practiced it. And as I'm, as I'm getting to this part, I'm looking at this thinking, wait a minute. He lied to them. What did he say? I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up. Not publicly, but in private. And, and it just struck me, that, wait a minute. Okay, Jesus knew what he was going to do. I mean, he's God's son. He's still God. Yes, he's, he's a humble human, but he's still God. So what's up with this? How, how do we do this? So we're going to talk about this for a second. We know Jesus without sin. If we believe the scriptures are true, we know Jesus without sin. Hebrews chapter 4 says this. In Hebrews chapter 4, we read these words, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So we know Jesus is without sin. Okay, so what's happening? What's happening in this passage? We either have a translation issue or an understanding issue, right? A translation issue or an understanding issue. One, for us, it's either, okay, either Jesus didn't tell a lie, or else there's something missing in the translation. Both of those, as I read through different scholars, both of those things seem to be potential. In John 7, 8, again, reading up, the, reading up this in the ESV, reading this, you go up to the feast, I am not going up to this feast, my time has not yet fully come. All right, that's the ESV. The New King James Version says it this way. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. There are some older manuscripts who have the not yet. There are some that do not have that included. So can we get conclusive based on this? I don't feel that I can. My opinion is I don't feel that I can. All right. But this is a valid understanding that there is the, the not yet. You guys go ahead. I'll be there. Right? Not yet going. Whatever we decide, we know an injustice was not done, so he was not breaking the Tenth Commandment. We also know Jesus died sinless, so he was not breaking any other laws either. And, and there's something here I wish I had time, because last night I was reading some stuff again, just going over this, and I should have put this in here. Who was he speaking to at this time? He was speaking to his brothers. His brothers who did not yet believe in him. And at the snarky tone is true, as John seems to imply, if Jesus was actually telling a lie to them, do you think they would have been quick to point that out at any given opportunity? I do. In their humanity, I do. So while I don't exactly know what Jesus meant, well, if I don't, and I don't exactly know, are there words missing in our English translation? Possibly. I don't know. His own brothers who were there, his own brothers whom he was speaking to at the time, his own brothers knew that it was not a lie that he said to them or they would have called him out on it. You can bet they would have called him out on it. Anytime a younger brother can rat out an older brother, what's going to happen? Rat the guy out, right? Amen, we say. Okay. We know these things. From a human perspective, we know these things. So when we read this verse and we say Jesus lied to them, we have an understanding issue. We don't exactly know everything that occurred in that conversation. Whether, again, it was Jesus saying, look, my time has not yet come. And that was them hearing, okay, my time is not yet. I'll be there. You guys go ahead. My time isn't yet. That's possible. We don't know. But we know those who were there did not feel like they were lied to. And so if those who were there did not feel like they were lied to, there's no way that we now, 2,000 years, can say, oh, you were lied to. We cannot ascribe something to them that didn't actually occur. That's what I know. And again, they said, well, you know, it was just a minor thing, whatever. There's one guy I talked to this week, one of my mentors. He said, well, he said it wasn't an injustice because Exodus 20, verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. That's the commandment from which you shall not tell a lie, right? But the context of this is in a judicial situation, bearing false witness, saying something that isn't true in order for an injustice to be done, in order to get somebody in trouble. Jesus didn't do that. We say, well, he was misleading them, was he? We don't know. We wasn't there. But he was definitely not bearing a false witness against his neighbor. That much we know for sure. And because he was sinless, frankly, we have to understand that we don't understand. That's what we have to know in this. 
Regardless, Jesus sent them, and then he went up in secret. He went up, not publicly, but in secret. He privately went into Jerusalem. Privately went into Jerusalem. After his brother got up to the feast, he also went up, and pu- not publicly, but in private. So he went up to Jerusalem. Now, why? Again, we don't know. We don't know why. We don't know his motives. We can assume from verse 1. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. So I'm going to go in secret. But why did he even go at all? Why go at all if that was the case? A few ideas here. Did he go to be obedient to the law? It was one of the things Jews, all Jew, Jewish men were supposed to attend this. Did he go to be obedient to that? Knowing what I know about Jesus from God's word, I would say yes, that sounds, that sounds right. Did he go privately so his brothers couldn't make a big deal out of him, right? They were up there, hey, you just need to be in front of everybody. We need to make a big deal out of you. Let's get this thing out in the open right now, right? Let's get this thing settled. Is that a possibility? Absolutely. Did he go privately so he wouldn't be recognized and killed? Also a possibility. It could be one of these. It could be all three of these to one degree or another. We don't know why he went in secret. We know that he went, being obedient to the law. We know that he went, not with his brothers, not so they could promote him out in public, at least not at this time. We just know he went. And while he was there, there was these murmurings in the crowd that occurred, these murmurings that were going on. Verses 11 through 12. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said he's a good man, others said, no, he is leading the people astray. So behind the scenes, this undercover boss, John kind of records this, you could hear the undertone of the crowd. They were talking privately, right? It wasn't really out in public, they were talking privately. You'll see that in verse 13, but they're talking privately about it. He's a good guy, right? He's good. Another saying, no, he's bad. This, these, are these private conversations where people are trying to figure out what to do with Jesus. You can see they wanted him there to kind of maybe end this debate. We don't know, but there was these private conversations happening, these murmurings in the crowd. What do you think about Jesus? Do you like him? Do you not like him? Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. Now remember, the crowd is the Jews. The crowd is made up primarily Almost 100%, and maybe 100% of Jewish people. So who are the Jews they're speaking of here? Again, an implication is the Jewish leaders. Charles Ryrie, in his commentary, he says, Since the crowd was all Jews, here the Jewish authorities must be men. So for fear of the Jewish authorities, for fear of the leadership of the Jews, nobody spoke publicly. Nobody's willing to stand up and say what they really thought. They weren't willing to do that. They're not willing to say in public what they really thought. Maybe a bit of a commentary on today in some of our own lives as well. Where we won't stand up and say what we really think. And this is where John ends the story. Right there. Kind of a weird place to put the pin down, I think. But that's where John ends this part of the story. So what do we do with this? How do we wrestle with this? A couple things to think about. And if I had time to rewrite, I probably would add a couple more things in here. One of the things I would add that wasn't in there is I'd ask this question again. If Jesus were to say to you, now is your time, what would that mean to you? What do you feel like God would want you to do this week if you comprehended and said, okay, to God telling you, now is your time? What would you do differently? What conversation might you have? What reconciliation might you seek? What would you do differently? if now were your time? Do you let public attitudes affect your worship? The Jews were doing this in public. They said, well, I'm here today, so no, I'm not letting the public affect my worship because I'm here today, right? If I let the public affect my worship, I wouldn't even be here. Okay. But let's say throughout the week you have these moments where something really great happens. These moments where you could say quite easily, wow, thanks, God. Do you ever verbalize that out loud when a coworker is present? When a neighbor is present, when somebody's with you, a little public worship, are we willing to do that? Or are we just like the crowd in Jerusalem where for fear of the Jews, they weren't willing to? Are you willing to worship, not just here at church, but outside these walls in public? Do you let public attitudes affect your evangelism? In other words, it's the whole idea of, hey, there's a God out there. 
Do you know that? Do you let public perceptions affect that? The people you're with, the people you roam with, do you let them affect what you talk about? Do you keep quiet out of fear? If this were your time, what would you do differently this week? If you had a complete grasp of that, if, or if one of those sayings, if that challenge was yours for the week, if this were your time, what would you do differently? I get a magazine publication, comes across my desk, called Voice of the Martyrs. And in May 2024, they had an article here that I wanted to share. In fact, I was going to have this about four sermons ago, and it didn't fit. And I thought, okay, God, must not have been wanting to use it. And then this sermon came up. I said, okay, perfect. I'm going to read some excerpts, not the whole story. It's too long. But some excerpts of a woman by the name of Twin who realized that this was her time. Twin Theodras had been a Christian for only two years when she is arrested in Eritrea the first time, Eritrea being a country in Africa. In February 2004, Twin, then 20, had just finished her mandatory military training and been assigned to work in, in Osmara, Eritrea's capital. Around that time, she visited a house church to worship with other Christians in secret. Eritrean authorities, however, who actively infiltrate secret churches, discovered the worship meeting at the house church and arrested the believers one day as they left the gathering. After spending the next month in prison, Twin was tricked into signing a document upon her release. Her father begged her to sign the document. He and the prison official both assured her that she was merely acknowledging that she could not preach in or attend a large church, but could still preach to small groups. But when she returned to her military post and gave her supervisor a letter from the prison, she learned that she had unwittingly agreed to return to the government-approved religious group to which she formerly belonged. I went home and started to cry and ask for forgiveness, she said. Kneeling beside her bed, she placed a Bible in front of her and imagined the letter she had signed resting beside it. I asked my soul to choose one. Are you ready to forsake your father, your mother, your siblings, your job, and your life? She asked herself, beginning of Luke chapter 14, verses 26 through 33. As she considered the scripture passage, she answered, I am ready. In essence, she was saying, this is my time. Eight months after her first arrest, while Twin and about 60 other Christians were observing a New Year's Eve prayer vigil, police surrounded their house and detained everyone inside. Twin and the other Christians were taken to prison, where they were locked in steel shipping containers. Conditions in these quote-unquote prisons, which are still used in Eritrea today, are some of the harshest in the world. During the day, again, in a steel shipping container, Twin said the heat became unbearable, and at night everyone struggled to stay warm. Prisoners received only lentil soup, bread, and tea, along with a limited amount of water to drink. During the day, the guards shut the small window on Twin's shipping container, preventing fresh air from flowing inside. The goal was to break her resolve and force her to sign another document stating she had renounced her faith. At around noon on one specific day, she began suffering shortness of breath from the stifling heat that built up in the container. I struggled to survive, she said. It was beyond my ability, and it was too much for me. I started to pray, God help me. Her prayer was answered in the form of another recalled passage of Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 4, 12-13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. After two years and ten months locked in the shipping container, mostly in isolation, Twin is transferred to another prison, I felt great joy because when they took me to the other place, I joined with other Christian sisters, and I felt as if I was getting released, so I praised God. In the second prison, where temperatures can climb above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, twin and other Christians were thrown into an underground cell, a hand-dug pit with walls made of stone. The guards tried to get the Christians there to renounce their faith. They tried to scare us with warnings that unless we renounce our faith, we'd suffer this or that, twin said, but our position was to be faithful even to death. The guards' torturous methods continued to evolve until eventually they forced the women to walk across the thorny ground under the scorching desert sun. Then they made us lie on the ground, she said. They started to beat us hard. They were beating one area on the shoulders, and they beat the same place again and again and again to cause maximum pain. At the end of the beating, the guards ordered the women to renounce their faith in Jesus Christ. She said to one of the guards, Christ gave me his life. So to give him my life is a small thing. 
as scripture says, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. I already gave my life to him. Instead of asking God to release her, sustain her health, twin prayed that he would help her remain faithful. After spending nearly six years in prison, she was allowed to leave temporarily to see a doctor for an eye condition. When the treatment required a second appointment, a friend persuaded prison officials to let her remain out of prison until the appointment. While she was out of prison, her parents tried to get her to sign a document renouncing her faith. One day, a church leader came with them to help persuade a twin. And using the story in Genesis 20, in which Abraham misleads Abimelech about his wife to avoid being killed, the church leader told twin that she needed to be wise like Abraham. His interpretation of the verse angered her. It's not good to twist the word of God, she told him. Surprised by her anger, the church leader apologized and abruptly ended the conversation. And one month later, after her second medical appointment, she decided to return to prison. She knew if she failed to return, others would be persecuted by the authorities. And how can I take the risk of seeing others suffer because of me, she thought. On the morning of September 8, 2020, Twin woke up early because it was her turn to cook breakfast for the other prisoners. After breakfast, one of the chiefs called her name, and she soon learned that she was being released after spending 16 years in prison. I always try to compare eternity with this short period of life on earth, she said. We're really here for only 70 or 80 years in this world, and I believe Christ is bigger than anything. He is good to me and everything I need, but God does things in his own time. The thing for me is to live for Christ. Reflecting on her own years of imprisonment, she said she's grateful for everything she gained through suffering. Even if it is a difficult time of my life, I think like Peter and John as they were counted worthy to suffer disgrace in the name of Jesus, and I feel joy when I remember my time in prison. And she also understands the importance of counting the cost of a commitment to Christ, such as the one she made in 2004 after her first arrest. That decision took me through the 16 years of suffering, she said. Here in America is likely, at least for the next several years, that we will not have to face a decision like that, but someday we might. That was a little girl at age of 20 said, this is my time. Are we willing to do the same? Jesus says these words in Matthew chapter 16, verse 25. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is our time. What is it that God wants from us? Are we like the Jews in Jerusalem, too scared to speak out in public? Or are we willing to do so for the sake of our Savior who died for us? What are we willing to do? God, today, this word is, is a challenge to me personally. I am not good at this. God, you know this. Quite frankly, I stink at it, to be perfectly honest with you. And it's an area that I'm trying to grow in in my own life. An area of being willing to have conversations. An area of being willing to praise you in front of others. An area in which I'm... I just know that I need to recognize your power and your might. We all have stories to share. We all have God-sized stories. God, I pray that we'd be willing to, be, to go public and be bold. Help us to grasp this as if this were our time. May we live for you. May we not be like the people undecided. I don't know if he's good. I don't know if he's bad. I don't know what to do, but regardless, we're just going to keep quiet about it. God, may we not be that. Help us to be bold in our witness, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join us.
chapter 2, we read these words, which are great for believers and unbelievers alike. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This week, remember that God has something for you. Good works prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. This is your time. Remember that this week. Father God, as we leave this place today, go to our Sunday school classes. I pray we continue to learn. But Lord, help us to remember the challenge that this is our time. The world cannot hate us, but it hates you. Lord, we are your ambassadors. As 2 Corinthians 5 says, I pray we would be your ambassadors for your glory. Give us the courage to do this well, because this is our time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.